All right, so we're going to get to the uh, <clears throat> second part of, uh, of chapter 7. And what we're going to be doing here is we're going to start to look at how we're going to have systems that are not isolated now. We're going to have systems that have dissipated forces. And so we have to make sure we understand how to utilize the conservation of energy to solve those problems. So I, I mentioned this in the last lecture. But what we have to start doing with our forces is figure out which forces are what we call conservative forces and which forces are non-conservative forces. The forces that are conservative uh, have a lot of very interesting properties to them. One of those properties <clears throat> being that they are path independent. So in the example that you see here, let's imagine we're talking about uh, maybe the gravitational potential energy of our, um, our uh, object here, and we're moving from point A to point B. So um, if it's gravitational potential energy, what we see happening here is that we're gaining in potential energy. We have point A, which is lower than point B, and uh, there's a couple different paths that we can take to move from point A to point B. And uh, what we're doing is whatever force is being applied here, we're doing work on the particle uh, and we're working against gravity here. And <clears throat> ultimately what's happening here though is uh, the any X direction motion that takes place has no part of gravitational potential energy. And so that will not contribute to increasing or decreasing potential energy. The only thing that really matters here is what happens in the Y direction. And uh, regardless of path, you end up with the same delta Y. And because of that, there is a path independence to this potential energy. And that means that gravity is a conservative force. It has an associated potential energy that depends on the state of the system. But we don't care about what happens in between. Um, let's see at the bottom here, we have our, uh, the work done by conservative forces is going to be, uh, the opposite of work done by conservative forces is, um, going to be equal to the change of potential energy. And the reason why that is, and let's just look at, 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 at what's going on here and bring up my annotations to do this. But when we do that. Let me share screen here so we can do that. So what's happening here is this. We know that we have the work kinetic energy theorem, right? So the work kinetic energy theorem says that uh, delta K, I don't know how to do the delta and the stuff here, is equal to the work. We also know from um, conservation of energy that delta K plus delta U, UG, equals zero. And that's just from conservation of energy. Now, again, what we're doing right now is we're not considering any external forces, dissipated things, so the, the sum of those two are going to be equal to zero, which means that delta K is equal to minus delta U. And uh, <clears throat> then we can... Go ahead and substitute that back to the top here, and we can see that delta U is equal to the minus uh, minus work done. Now, this is for a conservative force. So if it's a conservative force that's doing work, what that's going to do, it's going to act to increase the potential energy of the system here. So um, if the, you know, let's give an example here. Say we're taking, um, you know, say you have, uh, you're holding a book in your hand, and you go to raise the book, right? So as you raise the book, you're increasing the potential energy of the system, okay? Now, gravity, though, is pointing downward, and your displacement's going up. So gravity would actually be performing negative work here, okay? And that negative work with the negative sign here results in a positive increase of potential energy. Okay, so we're just concerned what gravity does. We're not concerned with what the hand does. Um, if we consider what gravity is doing, um, the lift in the book is negative work by gravity. And so the negative with this negative here gives us the change of potential energy. All right, move it on. Ah, what about non-conservative? Well, non-conservative forces are ones where the path does matter. 
And if you look at the start and the finish here for this particular path here, we can go on the straight line path from start to end, or we can go on this curved path. But ultimately what's happening, if you're considering the work that's being done by friction, okay, uh, you know, the expression for work is the force times the distance. Well, if you're doing the straight line thing, your distance is less than it is as you go along the curve. And so that means there's more work being done by friction to go on this bottom portion here. And because of the lack of path independence, that means our force, our frictional force, is not a conservative force. Here's what the value for the work done by friction would be, okay? The mu sub kmg, assuming that we have an object that's just on level ground, that's the force in delta s is obviously the displacement here. And if we can identify that the path matters, <clears throat> then we have a non-conservative force here. That means there is no associated potential energy with that. And so if we have to incorporate that in conservation of energy, we are forced to treat that as work. So now we're blending together these two ideas of conservation of energy, and we can separate things between conservative and non-conservative forces. Okay, but when we have non-conservative forces, you have no choice but to do work. And pretty much the only example that we're going to have, at least in this lecture and later in the class, of non-conservative forces is friction. That's really the only thing that you'll need to be concerned with. Okay, and what we say is that friction does work, and uh, we will say that when that energy is dissipated, it turns into e-thermal. Okay, so that's the e-thermal term that we're going to have, right? Okay. <clears throat> so now we can look at our conservation energy a little bit differently here. So, you know, if you think about work kinetic energy theorem, let's write that up here. The work kinetic energy theorem is delta K equals net work. Now, net work is now split up into work done by conservative forces and work done by non-conservative forces. The conservative forces here turn into a minus delta U. And we still have our non-conservative force here. Well, now you can move the delta U to the other side and we get this new, well, not, it's not new, it's, it's this more developed conservation of energy. Delta K plus delta U is, is that's again, that's the change in the mechanical energy. And that's zero if you deal with conservative forces that have potential energies. If you have any non-conservative forces, well, there is, a amount of work that's being done. And so, for example, if it's friction, it's going to take energy out of the system, and this will be a negative quantity right here, and that means the change in energy is going to go down. And so what you will have here is if you have a conservation energy problem that you're going to do, you're going to have to somehow keep track of this work as uh, on uh, the side of the equation that contains the final stuff because that energy has been removed, and we have to still bookkeep, basically, uh, that missing energy there, right? <clears throat> okay, so the energy transformation, when these kind of situations happen, like I said, the really the only thing we're going to be concerned about here is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, friction. So uh, the way we will talk about the energy transformation there is, you know, just think about an example where you take a, an object like a book and you slide it on a table. Well, the moment it leaves your hand, it possesses a bunch of kinetic energy, but then eventually the book does come to a stop, right? And that means uh, it loses the kinetic energy, and then it goes somewhere, right? So what we say the energy transformation here is, in this situation, is that the kinetic energy is being transferred to e-thermal. Okay, so it possesses kinetic energy, and that energy goes away, and it's transformed into e-thermal. And so what that means is, you know, the book heats up a little bit, and the table may heat up a little bit, and there's other, you know, other forms of energy here too. You know, if you hear us, if you hear it sliding, then obviously some of the energy went into uh, sound, so that was put into the pressure of uh, sound waves coming out, and um, I don't know, say you have, uh, well, I mean, there's, you could have other things, light is another example, you know, for example, if you are, you know, something's hanging from a car as it's driving, sometimes you see sparks coming off, that, you know, that's, that's part of e-thermal there too, in a way, so...
Well, wouldn't uh, I guess I can't call it ethermo, but I mean, we're not going to have situations where it's a dissipative. It's ener dissipative energy. Let's put it that way. Okay. All right. So um, when we do this, though, so uh, if we do have um, work being done by friction, uh, the way that we're going to handle it is that we're going to talk about increase in thermal energy. So we are identifying that the work being done by friction is going to directly be converted into E thermal. So instead of actually just saying work done by friction, we're going to say E thermal equals the work done by friction. I'm uh, sorry, it equals the uh, force of friction times the uh, the um, times the displacement that's going to occur here. So, um, you know, what will always happen here, this will always be a term that shows up on the final the final state. Uh, part of the energy conservation equation uh, because uh, dissipative forces always uh, will remove energy from a system and, and turn it into e-thermal. You don't have it going the other way around. Uh, you can't have some kind of frictional force or other kind of force that somehow increases uh, the thermal energy. That's uh, kind of a violation of thermodynamics and uh, we're not good. we can't do that. So. All right, so let's do an example here where we're going to incorporate this stuff. Let's look at how this was going to work. Mm. There we go. No, that's not right. Stop. Which one is it? It's this one. Right? Yeah, okay. So, um, I 20 kilogram child slides down a three meter high playground slide. She starts from rest and her speed at the bottom is two meters per second. What is the energy transformation? How much thermal energy was generated? Okay, well, we have a before and after picture, all right? And then you got your slide. This looks fun, all right? There's your ladder or something, I don't know. There's your ground. Oh gosh, don't make fun of me. All right, so at the top here is our before, right? And then our bottom here is the after picture. So what do we have before? Well, we're not moving to begin with, so we have no kinetic energy. Uh, we're at some height, so we just have gravitational potential energy. And that's really the only part of, uh, of the energy you can talk about. We only possess gravitational potential energy. <clears throat> As you slide down the slide, that gets removed, okay? And so we could say our energy transformation is gravitational potential energy into kinetic anti-thermal. Okay, now the reason why we are saying that is because if you were to work this out, right? So imagine you have, imagine you don't have this term here. Let's just say you slide and slide, there's no friction at all. Okay, and work out what the speed is. It won't be two, right? It won't be two. If you work out just MGH equals one half MV squared, you'll see you'll get a higher speed. So that means that wasn't the only energy that was that was involved here. So what we see is the gravitational energy leaves, and we see an increase in the kinetic, and we see an increase in, in the thermal. So we know that um, there's actually two things to put on the other side. So you don't always have, it's always not always one energy to another energy. It can be one energy into two different energies. Uh, or, you know, on the left-hand side, you can have two energies that go down, and then it transfers to other things. So it's possible. So the left-hand side is all my initial stuff. Okay, I don't have a term for e thermal. I don't have a term for work. I don't have a term for kinetic energy. I only have gravitational potential energy, so MGH. Zero point is going to be at the bottom of the slide. Uh, I do have some kinetic energy when I reach the bottom, and then I'm going to have some leftover stuff. I'm just going to say e thermal. Um, we don't really have any details about the slide, so we really can't put in a friction here. We don't really want to know that. I mean, the question asks how much thermal energy, so we don't know, need to go into that detail yet. Later on, we will do that. So uh, we put in our numbers here, and we solve for e thermal, and we get 548 joules, all right? Now, how much energy is that? Let's just do some numbers here. Let's crunch some numbers. Okay, what is the MGH? Well, actually, I'll write it right below here. How about that? Let's do that. Okay, so what's, what's my calculator? 20 times 20 times 9.8 times 3. Are you kidding me? Wow. 588 joules. That's quite a bit. Well, compared to our e-thermal here. The next part, 1 half, 20, times 4. Syntax there, come on. 0.5 times 20, times 4. Got it. 
40 jewels. Oh, man. That means... Look at that. Tons of energy gone. Right? What if... What if... What if all... Let's do that. What if all of that potential energy was put into kinetic energy? Let's see what that would be. 0. 0.5, right? Times 20 times velocity squared. What do we get? Let's see. 588 times 2 divided by 20. Square root. 7.6 meters per second. That's what we end up getting here. So, yeah. Or so. Meters per second. So, thank goodness for friction. Because uh kid's going to get to the bottom of that slide and have an issue here. So you can see here that most of the energy was taken as the e-thermal. Right? So that's a, that's what we mean by bookkeeping here, right? They're keeping track. This is the system energy. And it was transferred. 40 went to kinetic. Most of it went to e-thermal. Okay. Fantastic. Oh my goodness, I'm getting lost here. All right, so this, you saw this slide last lecture. Okay, so just to remind you of how things are working here. The change in the kinetic, the change in the potential, and any thermal that occurs, right? The first two terms of the mechanical energy, the thermal, still there. You combine these together, it's the total system energy. And if there's any change, it's due to some kind of external work here, okay? So, here's kind of a summary of everything we've had so far. We had the work kinetic energy theorem that we did. And what we see that we can do, now that by itself, what we do in this problem here is you say, okay, well, uh, you know, the work net, and you do this, you're not considering any potential energies here. You're just considering all the forces that act on it, and what kind of work they perform, and that tells you the change of kinetic energy. Well, what we've been doing in these last two lectures is we're developing W net. And so what we said is that W net can be broken up into conservative work, well, work done by conservative forces, work done by non-conservative forces. Okay, well, we can take that a step further. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, well, we still have our conservative work, but now we can take our non-conservative work and we can break it up into two parts. Dissipative forces, Okay, that's friction and work external. Now, work external would be like, you know, a hand that pushes on a block to speed it up. That's external work. You know, it's, it's sort of a vague force maybe that imparts uh, work into the system. But the non-conservative stuff can either have a very standard form or it can just be kind of, you know, like a hand or something like that. And so the, the dis here, right, that dis here is... Uh, is the uh, it's the e-thermal basically okay so <clears throat> conservation of energy looks like this down here well that's the same as what's up here because the work conservative right is minus delta u and that's where it is here and this is going to remove energy from the system and it's going to end up being a, a, a minus uh, delta e thermal now the reason the minus is there is because the work that's being done is we're removing energy for the system but we move that to the other side and we get the familiar thing here so really these these are two you know different sides of the same concept here okay um and it's just a matter of what you find to be more convenient easy to work with um you know hope you know i want you to see the work kinetic energy theorem but part of the reason why i'm showing you that is because we already did all this stuff with forces and and my recommendation is that we kind of stick with the conservative energies here, uh, the conservation of energy down here, okay? But the purpose of this slide is to sort of show you how this eventually transforms to this down here, which is pretty cool if you ask me, actually. All right, so what I'm gonna introduce here, now I don't believe your textbook actually goes through something like this, but um, what I'm trying to do here is to show, uh, you know, more a more visual way to think about um, you know, uh, you know, how the concept of energy transformations work. 
So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be, you know, utilizing this equation that's down here, and but I'm going to rearrange terms because what you have in the delta k down here, you have a minus, um, you have a, you, you know, this is k final minus k initial, and this is u final minus u initial. Well, the initials go to the other side, and then you end up with this. So this equation up here is the same as the one that's down here. And I really like this version of the equation. In fact, this is this is this is the ideal version of the equation, right? Because we have our kinetics to begin with, we have our uh, our potentials to begin with, and then we have this term for external work. Now, what's going on here with this? Well, if it's positive work, that means the initial energy of the system, well, the initial energy of the system is, is k and u, but if this positive work, that means we're increasing the energy of the system here. Likewise, if this is negative, that's going to decrease. The energy of the system here. Now, on the other side, we have our final stuff here, okay? And this e-thermal, remember, this is the work that's done by dis dissipative forces, which pretty much will only be friction for what we deal with here. And this is this is here for bookkeeping. You know, if there's friction involved, that means the stuff that occurred over here is less than what's here. And this is just accounts for that missing energy that's not in kinetic or potential. So I really like this equation a lot because it, it, it conceptually really communicates like what's happening with everything here. So I think this is, in my opinion, the best. I mean, really, this is the best way to talk about conservation of energy. That's my opinion, but I, th I, I think highly of my own opinions. So, <laughs> All right, so um, what you see in the example down here is this. Uh, you know, we have some object, right? And apparently it possesses a little bit of kinetic energy and a bunch of potential energy. Something is acting on our system to remove energy. So something's doing negative work in our system here. So if you count the bars here, we got one, two, three, four bars of energy, okay? Or segments or whatever you want to call these things. I'll call them bars of energy. But we have one negative bar. So when we go to the other side and look at how things have changed, we have to make sure that bars add up, right? So what has happened here is um, whatever was going on with this work, and I mean, we don't know the details of what's happening, but what apparently happened is the kinetic energy went up a little bit. The potential energy disappeared. And uh, some of our energy uh, was dissipated away, probably as friction. But ultimately, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 1, and 1, 2, 3. So we have three bars over here. We have three bars over here. So this may be another thing if, if you find this to be convenient to use. This is kind of nice to, um, to you know, keep track of the concept of energy. So I don't know if this will be helpful to you or not, um, but it's sort of like, you know, the, the way you can sort of work out. And it's just like the, you know, motion diagrams from before and the force identification diagrams and the uh, force interaction diagrams. These are all little tools that maybe you could use if you're, if you're struggling with the concepts. And this is the same idea. You know, maybe you utilize this a few times and then, then you can, you know, sort of graduate from this and, and then you can think about uh, the energy, uh, uh, you know, without, without the use of these things. But, I mean, if, of course, if you need you to use these, by all means, do so until you become more comfortable with just uh, not using them. Okay. So let's look at what's going on here. How much work is done by the environment in the process represented by the energy bar chart? Okay. So you may want to pause the video and think about this for a bit. But the answer is going to be B, negative 1. Right, so let's just count it up. And all we're doing is counting, right? Five bars over here, four bars over here. We must have one. Uh, oh, I guess our bars are joules here, right? So we got five joules here. We got four joules here. So we must have negative one joules here. All right, great. <clears throat> okay, so just now let's actually try to connect a very simple example up to a bar chart. And this is, you know, simple enough. We just throw a ball into the air and we want you to come back down. So the way the energy transformation is going to look here, we already know what the energy transformation is for this entire thing. It's zero. This is nothing. There's no change in energy. But if we consider from here up to here, right, that's gravitational potential energy. Well, sorry, it's kinetic energy to begin with that's turned into gravitational energy. So you see that down here. We possess all kinetic energy. Halfway through the flight, we see that the kinetic energy is going down. The potential energy is going up. When we reach the top, it's all potential energy. And then, of course, going down is the same thing. So this is an example of how the bar charts would represent a simple motion like this thing right here. All right, so what I'm going to do now is we're going to go through um, various examples, okay? And we're going to try to imagine what the energy transformation is. And then we're going to visualize that on the bar chart, okay? 
So, uh, speed and car skids to a halt. So the energy transformations on energy bar chart. So, um, there's a before and an after. So the before will be, you know, the car's moving. And the after is when it comes to a stop. So what should the energy transfer and transformations be? So this is another example where you may want to pause the video and think about this before I reveal the answer. But the energy transformation here will be kinetic to e-thermal. Okay. We possess kinetic energy to begin with. We lose it and it goes somewhere. Well, what would do this? Friction would do this. So that would be transferred to e-thermal. I guess we got three bars on the left here, three bars on the right. No potential energy uh, to think about here because we're not going up or down and there's no external work being done. Okay, now you say, well, what, what is it? friction external work? Again, friction is classified as like e-thermal. Um, if we can characterize what that external work is, then that's going to be e-thermal. When, you know, work external is sort of like a vague Thing like, like again, like a hand, you know, coming in and uh, affecting the system. All right. Rope lifts a box at a constant speed. Show the energy transfer and the transformations on the energy bar chart. All right. So think about this one a bit. All right. What's the before and after? Well, the before is when the box is lower and after is when it's a little bit higher. So what's our energy transformation going to be here? It's going to be work external to gravitational energy. So um, it's constant speed. So there is kinetic energy, but doesn't change. So that means it's not going to be in the energy transformation. We have the same kinetic energy before as we do afterwards. Now, over here, remember the left-hand side is thought of in a couple different ways. You can talk about, you know, well, ultimately, the left-hand side is the source of energy. And so if that's something like kinetic or potential, it's the source and it goes down, right? And then the other one goes up. Well, in the case of external work, it's it's not something that goes down, it goes up necessarily, but it is the source of energy. And so we identify the source of energy as being work done by an external force. So the rope that lifts the box is a tension, right? And that tension is a force through a distance, so it's performing work, right? It's a constant speed though, so we're not speeding up. All right, I'm not speeding up. If you think about work kinetic energy theorem, okay, what's going to happen here is ropes up, tension up, gravity down. So the network is zero. Network is zero. Okay, but the gravitational potential energy, okay, that's a conservative force. Right? So that means there is going to be an increase in the potential energy. So network is results in no change in kinetic energy, but then we break those things up into conservative, non conservative forces, right? So the rope's a non conservative force, gravity is a conservative force. So we got three bars of external work, and that transforms into three bars of potential energy. So that is the energy transformation here. All right, the box from the previous example falls at a steady speed as the rope spins a generator and causes a light bulb to glow. All right, what's the energy transformation here? Okay, so think about this again. And the answer here is the opposite. UG do work external. Okay, so we possess some uh, potential energy. It goes down. That's the source of our energy. And it goes somewhere. Where does it go into? Well, it's not a thermal. Again, we only use that for friction. It's work. It's external work that's being done. Okay, so what we would say here is on the left hand side, the our initial stuff is we have our kinetic energy is not changing, we have a bunch of potential energy, and then we have this work external, but that's negative here because we're taking energy out of the system. And so when everything's done, what do we have? Well, we just have our thing moving, but we don't have any potential energy here. Okay, so UG, source of energy, it goes down. Where's the energy go? It goes into doing work on the environment. All right. Fantastic. Oh my goodness, I love this problem. Okay, this is a great problem. Very, very good problem. So, um, and uh, I, there's two reasons why I like this problem. One, it's just a great problem. And two, there are no numbers. I like problems with no numbers. In fact, if I could choose, I would never give you a problem with a number in it. But that's my own preference. It's probably not a great thing for you to learn. Well, no, it is a good thing. Half the problem should be with no numbers. Half of them should be with numbers. Okay. Maybe 60% no numbers. How about that? All right, let's see what's going on in this example here. 
maybe six, maybe 70, maybe 70. How about that? Maybe 70, 75. We'll go with 75. All right. Awesome problem. Here we go. All right. Analyze each energy transformation. So I'm going to tell you right off the bat here. Okay. The I am doing this as an example to demonstrate energy transformations. If this was a problem that we have to solve, I would not do it this way. So let me explain what I, the intention of this example is. And then at the end, I'll explain to you, well, if this was actual problem, what you ought to be doing here. Okay. So here's what I'm intending in this example here. The block slides down the ramp. It goes across a horizontal surface that has some friction and then it goes up the ramp. So I actually am, again, this is for the purposes of my example here, I'm gonna break this up into three parts. You don't need to break it up into three parts, okay? To solve, okay, I, I told you I was gonna do that at the end. All right, so I'm not gonna say that right now. All right, so gravitational potential to kinetic energy is the first transformation, all right? So um, the box loses gravitational energy and it speeds up, right? So that would be, on the left hand side here. Again, we don't have any kinetic energy, so you don't see a kinetic energy term on the left here. And on the right, you don't really see any potential energy term because we're gonna say the zero point is on the ground. So it's gravitational potential energy being converted to kinetic energy. That kinetic energy, I'll put down in the second part here, and my energy transformation now is kinetic energy to thermal. So what happens is a box possesses some kinetic energy, which will go down, it doesn't go to zero, it leaves, and the thermal goes up a little bit, okay? So what will happen here is this. I have some kinetic energy to begin with, and that's the only energy I have in my system, and that's broken up into two parts, E-thermal and some lower kinetic energy here. Now the E-thermal, remember how we characterize that, it's force times distance. So the force is mu sub kmg, that's mu sub k times normal force. This is horizontal, so normal force is mg. The L is the, dis is the, is the distance that the force acts. So the, the sticky patch here, or whatever this is, this uh, rough surface is only of length L right here. So uh, mu sub kmgl. It's not the entire length of the thing because the energy is only being dissipated on the rough patch here. Okay. And then the last part is our lower kinetic energy being converted into a gravitational energy. So it goes up the ramp, then we get some gravitational energy. And so that's going to be 1 half mv squared. Now the v is from the second part here, and that turns into some other energy here. All right, so that's how we characterize everything here, right? Now, if we want to solve this as a problem, okay, we look at the before and after. The before is 0.1 and the after is 0.3, okay? Now, remember back in the last lecture, I, I kept saying over and over again, we don't care what happens in between. We don't care what happens in between, right? But then I prefaced, I didn't preface, I, I qualified that statement by saying, okay, well, as long as there's no external forces or dissipative forces. Well, we have a dissipative force here, so we do now need to pay attention to what happens in between, right? So in going from one to three, we have a, 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 a moment here where friction acts and does dissipate energy from the system, okay? So, so when you do have dissipative forces or you do have some kind of external work being done, you, you do now need to be mindful of the intermediate steps here. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to do part two. I could still go from one to three. The energy transformation is UG to E thermal. Ultimately, when you look at one and you look at three, you say, okay, the block is up at this height. And when I get over to the three, it's going to be up the ramp, but at a lower height, a lower height, right? Because some of the energy is gone. So UG to E thermal is the correct energy transformation for the overall thing. Okay. And I don't have to consider kinetic energy here. Okay, because it's an intermediate thing. Okay, and but the kinetic energy is not a dissipative force, anything like that. So I don't need to really consider what's going on with that. So we have MGH to start, and then that's transferred into MGH1, which is the lower height, and then the uh, work that's done by friction. So this is a really great equation because it, it tells you mathematically what's happening. We possess a bunch of potential energy, and it's being broken up into two sources. Some is dissipated away, which is this thing here, and then we're left over with a little bit of extra, uh, not extra, but uh, we're left over with uh, with slightly less potential energy. So the MGs all drop out, 
and we get this really beautiful looking relationship here, H plus e equals H1 plus mu sub KL. This mu sub KL is how much the height has actually lowered from what I originally was. So that's a very nice relationship right there. So anyway, it's a really great example. Uh, but remember, I did two different things here. I first just analyzed all the parts of the uh, motion here. Uh, and then I said, okay, now I'll solve it. Okay, and the kinetic energy is not needed here, not needed ultimately. Okay. Okay, so, um, oh, you thought you were done with pulleys and, and slide blocks, huh? Nope, you're not. But you'll be good, you'll be happy to know that this will be a bit easier to solve now, okay? So you want to spot, find the speed of the fallen block in terms of the given variables with and without friction. So, by the way, that problem on your exam with you had the, the rope, you know, they had the block hanging with the rope that was wrapped around the pulley there. You could solve that problem with energy and it would have been a lot easier. Um, I mean, you know that now, but I wanted you to solve it with forces before. But you might actually want to revisit that uh, that problem and see how you might do that with energy. It would be very simple to what's going on here, similar to what's going on here. All right, so let's look at how this example is going to go. So with and without friction, all right? So let's do the without friction first, obviously. Oh, man, this problem is really good, too. I got all these good problems for you. All right, without friction, what's happening here? Well, energy transformation is UG to K, okay? We possess some gravitational potential energy. Little m does that. Little m's got the gravitational potential energy. And then what happens with that? Well, that block falls, so it loses it. And then this block speeds up, and this block speeds up. So that's the energy transformation. What's happening initially? Well, I'm not going to keep track of the potential energy of capital M because it doesn't ever go up or down. So, I mean, I could include it here if I want to, but there would be no reason to do that because it would be the same on the left and the right. So the only energy to really characterize here is the potential energy of this block, and I'm going to call the zero point... Um, you know, when it reaches the bottom. So this right here, that's our zero point right there. So the block will fall H. So I'm going to just say MGH is the initial energy. And then what does that transfer into? It transfers to a bunch of kinetic energy. So we have the kinetic energy of the, of the little m and the kinetic energy of the big M here. Okay. And, um, and that's all I have to characterize here. Um, the You know, the, just to be clear, the, the rope is massless, the pulley is massless, and frictionless bearings and all that good stuff, right? So uh, you solve for V, we factor the V out of this, and we do some mathematical magic here, and we end up with this expression here that tells us what this be. Now, if you did this with forces, you'd get the same answer, but uh, you would ha not have as much fun, and it would take a lot longer. So uh, this is definitely the ideal way to go with this. If you, you do it with energy, you know, sometimes you can't. Um, but in this case, we could. Now, what about with friction? How are things going to change? Well, they're not going to change much. The only difference in the energy transformation is now we have some e-thermal here. Because what will happen is this capital M up here, right, is going to have some energy removed because of friction. So we are still going to possess the same amount of energy to begin with. But what will increase or what the energy turns into is going to be less kinetic now and some e-thermal. So if you look down here, I have the exact same expression as up here, except for this thing right here. Let me highlight this. This right here is now the e-thermal. Okay, so this is, just to be clear, right, just to be very clear about what I'm doing here. Where's my text? Okay. So I'll write it up here so I can see, see that. I write in red? Let's do that. So this is going to be F sub K times H. So that's that's the work that's being done. Force of friction times distance. Okay, well, check this out. If this block falls H, well, obviously this block has to slide over H. So that's the, that's the distance at which the force is being applied. Well, what's F sub K? Well, it's mu sub K times normal force times H. 
hey, what's normal force? Well, normal force is, you know, this block's horizontal. So normal force is up, gravity's down. That means the magnitude of the horizon of the of the uh, the magnitude of the normal force is just capital Mg. So that's how we end up with this expression down here. Uh, we're going to move this term over to the other side. We'll do the same thing. We'll factor out the v, divide by all this stuff here, and we end up with this expression here, which is a, which is a really great expression. It looks just like this one up here, and you can see something. Look at the speed, right? You have the 2 mgh up here, and you have the 2 mgh up here, but you have something being subtracted, and this is telling you what friction's doing to you. Oh, sorry. What's, what's friction doing? Friction's going to slow you down, right? If you have this term here, this is going to reduce your speed. So I, this is why I like not doing things with numbers, because you look at the equations and you can just see the behavior. That, that's why it's so cool to do things without numbers. So it looks just like this, but you're subtracting in the numerator. So you're going to have less speed corresponding to what kind of thing? What, what does it correspond to? Well, the more friction you have, the mu sub k will be larger. That will contribute, right? If your mass up here is bigger, right, that, that might do something. I don't know. There's another mass down here, so it's going to be a little tricky how that actually handles here. But anyway, H is up here. I mean, H is here too. So if H is increased, obviously that's going to matter as well. Anyway, okay. In fact, what you could have, right, if these things are large enough, you wouldn't have any more kinetic energy. This thing could actually stop, right, and this doesn't even reach down here. That's possible. So what you'd have to do is, ooh, that's an interesting problem. How do you know if you even makes it, right? Maybe you dissipate so much energy that these are gone. Well, what would happen is if you work out this numerator up here, if this second term is big enough, it will be larger, obviously, than MGH, and end up with a negative under the radical which you can't have, and that would be math telling you you didn't make it to the bottom here. Thanks, math. Very helpful. Okay, great problem. Great problem. All right. Oh, man. What is this? Oh, this is a good problem, too. They're all good problems, I'll be honest. They're all good problems. Let's look at this one. Oh, we're on near the end here. All right, what do we got? We got a five kilogram block, or box, sorry, slides down a five meter high smooth hill from rest. Ooh, ooh, let's draw a picture. Let's draw a picture. Ah. Uh, What's the picture? Okay, we got a smooth hill. Uh, can I draw a smooth hill? Let's draw a smooth hill. That's pretty good. Although, let's try that one more time. Okay, now... Nice. All right. And then we got friction. Oh, we got friction. So I got to make a little choppy. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here. All right. That's the choppy part. And then we got a spring here, right? Yeah. All right. We got a box. All right. So. Box slides. Well, okay, well, hold on. What's going on here? Well, zero points down here, right? Zero points, this thing here. So we're five meters up, right? That's our five. Okay. And uh, what do we possess? Well, we just possess potential energy from gravity, right? Well, we're not moving, right? It starts from rest. So we know that the left-hand side is going to be UG. Okay, there's no external work, so I don't have to include anything there. It slides down. At the bottom, it gets a whole bunch of kinetic energy. Uh, it loses some of that kinetic energy as it goes over the rough patch. So when it gets over here, it's going a little slower. But then it hits the spring, and it compresses the spring. So all the kinetic energy is being transformed into spring potential energy. And we'll assume... And so when it says, how much does the spring compress? I mean, obviously what will happen is we'll compress the spring, and then the box will fly off. 
And um, and actually, we'll explain what happens when it flies off there. But let's just assume it, you know, it hits it, it compresses it completely, and then we just look at right when it's compressed completely. So the energy transformation here is UG to E thermal and U spring, right? No kinetic is here, right? Because the snapshot is we're at the beginning when we're at the top of the hill, and the, and the, the, the after part is when the spring is fully compressed. So in neither cases are we moving. So what we see happen here is we have an increase in kinetic energy, then we have a decrease in kinetic energy. It's all intermediate stuff, um, but it's not something we have to keep track of there because uh, you only have to keep track of dissipative forces when you're doing intermediate things like friction. So um, the Bach possesses MGH, right? This is the familiar way we do e-thermal with the work done by friction. So this is the force, distance, and then, of course, the spring potential is 1 fk delta x squared. And we want to solve for our delta x here, because that's how much the springs we can compress. So, again, this looks familiar, doesn't it? That's what we had last time. This is what would, this would be, and 2 mgh is the potential energy, and this term over here is what's being dissipated by friction. If there's no friction, this term's gone here. So, anyway, we see this is compressed 0.94 meters, right? Um, let's actually do some numbers here. Let's look at some numbers. Okay, I'm going to write up here. What are what? Let's bookkeep things. Let's actually look at the bookkeeping here. So what do we got here? Well, MGH is five times nine point eight times the height, which is five. So we start off with two hundred and forty-five joules of energy. Well, that's what our system. That's our ESIS. Right. What was dissipated by friction? Well, 0.25 is the coefficient of friction of mass is five, gravity is gravity, 9.8, and the height is five, wait, no, wait, no, distance is two. So, f ooh, 24.5 joules, that's exactly a tenth, exactly a tenth. Now I can obviously see what this would be here, but I'm just gonna put the numbers in, 0. 0.5, just to make sure everything makes sense. Spring constant is 500, and the delta X here, well, according to this, was 0.94, and uh, actually was a there's more digits there, so I got to write all that out. But it's oh, I didn't square it. Shoot. Okay, so that's going to be all right. So we don't lose too much energy. We lose about a tenth of our system energy. And then we're left with this, which all goes into the spring. So here's what's interesting. What, 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 what will happen afterwards, right? What will happen? Well, eventually the spring is going to push the block back, right? And if we're going to go back up the ramp, the energy transformation is going to be, so this would be for going, this is the aftermath here, aftermath. Back up a ramp, right? What's the energy transformation there? Well, U spring, two, E thermal, plus U G. And get what happens here. Well, it's gonna go back. Is this term any different? No, it's not. So we lose another 24.5. Okay, this is exactly a 10th of four, uh, 245. So what does that mean? That means this block is gonna Slide across here, lose 10% of its energy, hit the spring. It's going to cross over this again, lose another 10% of its energy, go up to a lower height, come back down, lose 10% of its energy, hit the spring, go back, lose 10 So it can pass over this patch 10 times. Okay, so this is what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. At the end of it all, our box is sitting right here at rest. After because because at this point, once it goes back, right, that's the that's the tenth trip across. And that's the last 10% of energy. And then the box just sits right there. Isn't that beautiful? Well, maybe beautiful is the wrong word, but it's cool. It's cool. That's a really this is a fantastic problem. Fantastic problem. In fact, the way I would give you this problem is I'd give you the setup and I'll say, how many times can we pass? Can we, you know, we, can we cross the patch here? 
that's that's a good one. That's a very good one. And I think I might be done. Let me just check. Anyway, very, very good example. Fantastic example, honestly. All right, what do you have left here? I think we are probably done. Oh, okay. Okay, so that, that's energy. And uh, the next lecture, we'll begin into collisions. So I will see your talk or to you later.